Hi, I'm Ryan Leiter. I'm sitting here in lovely frigid Chicago at the University of Chicago Law School. And you are? Um, I am Scott Shapiro, and I am uh, here at Yale Law School, um, and it is raining and ugly outside. So, um, okay, so our weather is comparable. Yes. So, so I was going to say a little bit by way of, of situating what this conversation is that, uh, that we're going to have. We're going to talk about this issue of theoretical disagreement uh, about, the, uh, about law, um, but this particular debate grows out of, uh, uh, of an article I wrote in 2003 called Beyond the Hart Dworkin Debate, um, which looked at this uh, seminal debate in, uh, in modern legal philosophy that was initiated, well, Hart published his classic book, The Concept of Law, in 1961, and Dworkin launched a series of criticisms beginning with his 1967 paper, The Model of Rules. This went back and forth. Various other legal philosophers uh, intervened in parts of this debate. And what I argued in my paper is that the debate was, in effect, over, that Hart was, in fact, um, uh, the Harshian position, suitably understood and modified, was the winner of this particular debate, and it was time to move on. And just when I thought it was time to move on, Scott Shapiro comes on the scene. And Scott, what did you say? Uh, I, I said, uh, you know, not so fast. Um, that uh, that uh, there there was a round two, which had not been in, um, that had not been addressed, um, and that it posed a very serious problem for Hart and his followers. I, I should just say, just at the onset. That, that I am a positivist, and we'll talk about what that means. But um, I, uh, this was um, a critique from within, um, and uh, I remember when I wrote the paper, Brian had said that I went over to the dark side um, uh, by, uh, by by accepting um, by accepting that uh, that Dworkin had uh, had really um, uh, made a very powerful critique, um, and then uh, you know, lo and behold, uh, uh, Brian wrote a an article um, responding, saying that, uh, in fact, um, there really wasn't anything uh, important there. And so, um, in, in a way, we're, we're, uh, we haven't actually spoken about, uh, about Brian's response, and so uh, this is um, uh, what hopefully we'll have today is, um, is really um, new for all of us, um, uh, right. trying to see whether... Um, whether uh, uh, the future of legal philosophy really should include the hard work and debate, or sh- it just should uh, kind of go away as a uh, historical uh, curiosity. Right. Very good. So uh, we thought maybe Scott, you would start talking a little bit for, for the benefit of those um, uh, who, who aren't primarily interested in legal philosophy. Say a little bit uh, generally about what the problems are in legal philosophy and sort of where this particular debate, the hard to work in debate, should be situated within that landscape. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, so one way traditionally that uh, legal philosophy is characterized is by distinguishing between two different areas, uh, sometimes called normative jurisprudence and analytical jurisprudence, jurisprudence being another name for legal philosophy. Uh, normative jurisprudence concerns the uh, moral foundations of the law, whereas analytical jurisprudence is more concerned with the metaphysical or conceptual foundations. Um, what I thought I might do is just describe some of the questions that arise in each area to get a better sense of what these uh, areas study. Uh, normative jurisprudence is uh, uh, concerns those uh, uh, really fascinating uh, red-blooded questions that, uh, that, uh, that are so frequently debated. Um, so, for example, uh, normative jurisprudence takes up the question of justification of punishment. Uh, why does the law punish criminals? Does it do it in order so that the criminals get their just deserts, or is it to deter people uh, from engaging in criminal behavior in the future? Is it to incapacitate them or to rehabilitate them? Is it there to um, satisfy the feelings of vengeance of members of the community? Um, or, uh, or it might take up the question about what the moral point or function is of contract law. Do courts enforce contracts in order to um, make sure that people abide by their promissory obligations, or rather does it, uh, is it concerned with maximizing economic efficiency? Um, sometimes normative jurisprudence takes a, a more critical perspective. Um, it asks, uh, regardless of what the moral logic of a particular field is, um, what, from the moral point of view, ought it to be? 
Um, so um, regardless of why our criminal law punishes uh, criminals, um, should, be, uh, should criminals be punished, um, regardless of whether women have the constitutional right to terminate their pregnancies, what from the perspective of political morality, what rights ought they to have. Um, so um, well-known schools like critical legal studies, critical race theory, feminist jurisprudence, these are all examples of normative jurisprudence because they um, study uh, uh, and critique the law from uh, a moral perspective. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, the um, analytical questions um, which deal more with metaphysics than with morality. Um, analytical jurisprudence uh, studies the nature of legal entities and asks what we mean when we make certain moral claims. So, for example, the questions that get asked are... Like Cer certain legal, legal claims. Yeah, yeah well, I'm sorry, what did I say? Moral you said moral claims. Yeah, th thank you very much. No, legal claims. So um, the uh, um, question uh, like, what is law? Uh, did the Nazis have law? Um, how are legal systems distinguished from other kinds of normative regimes like games, religion, uh, popular morality, etiquette? Um, are legal rights species of moral rights? Are, um, is legal reasoning a special kind of reasoning, or is it just ordinary reasoning applied in a particular um, institutional context. Those are the sort of questions that analytical jurisprudence um, um, concerns itself with, um, and that's what we're going to be debating today, um, the, 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 those sort of questions. Um, uh, having taught legal philosophy in law schools for, for, for 13 years, my, my, uh, my strong sense is, um, my experience is that, um, I wonder if you, you agree with this, Brian, um, that uh, uh, our colleagues tend to find normative jurisprudence extremely interesting. Those questions are really, um, really uh, grip them, but uh, the analytical ones um, are often taken to be dull as uh, dishwater. Um, is that? Uh, I, I think it's, I think it's fair to say that um, uh, many legal scholars find it hard to get excited about these particular questions. I think it's partly because, as as John Gardner has nicely put it. Um, the answers to these questions, uh, certainly within the positivist tradition, tend to be normatively inert. Right? That is, having specified the, the correct metaphysics of law, of what law is, um, not much actually follows about what ought to be done, um, which, of course, is part of the point. And, but that, I think, is usually disappointing to law professors, especially American law professors who... Uh, who have a, a strong policy wonk streak? Uh, actually, that's what, that's funny. I, I, no, I actually think that they are uh, that these questions are of immense practical importance. Um, that um, that they're not normatively inert, um, um, and w maybe we'll get to that later on about whether I, I agree with you. They, they have practical implications, but I, I take it what, what Gardner meant in saying that, say, legal positivism. Was uh, was normatively inert is that the the correctness of the positivist theory of law doesn't, for example, entail anything about what the rules of tort law ought to be, right? Oh. Or what the rules of contract ought to be, or what well, regime actually, of criminal I, law we should have. Oh, uh, uh, well, right. In that sense, they, they may tell you. I, I think they do tell you what the law, what the tort law we have is, but it doesn't right. tell you what the tort law we ought to have is, right? Sure. We, Right, okay, right. Right, it doesn't okay. say anything about how the rules ought to be reformed or any any of the kind of normative questions that theories of corrective justice or theories of economic efficiency and so on would actually answer. Right, well, but they but they but they um, but they would um, impact the question of like let's say how to interpret the law. Would you? Um, wouldn't you say that? Well, possibly, possibly, but maybe before we go to that, we will right, okay. if we get too far ahead of ourselves. We were going to talk a little bit about now sort of the, the two main traditions within um, analytic or general jurisprudence, um, namely the tradition of legal positivism and the tradition of natural law theory, with, um, with Dworkin um, perhaps on the natural law theory side of that, uh, that divide, though as, as I said to you, I'm inclined to think John Mackey was right years ago in calling Dworkin's theory the third theory of law. But for our purposes, I guess we'll probably treat him as on the, on the natural law theory right. side. Do you want to try to say something by way of an initial characterization of the positivist natural law dispute before I talk a little bit about the particulars of the hard working debate? Yeah, sure. Let, let, yeah, let me let me do that. Um, and I hope what I say is not too controversial because I mean, what positivists stand for and what natural lawyers stand for. I mean, the, of course, that's that's um, that's, that's uh, right, right, exactly. So 
this is the way at least um, I think a lot of people think about it, at least I, I think about it, um, that for the legal positivist, the um, uh, law and morality abide by very different ground rules. Um, uh, in, if you want to establish the, um, the truth of some moral proposition, acceptability of some moral, um, uh, moral argument, you have to um, deduce uh, uh, moral considerations. Um, it's never enough to say, that's what we do around here. We're, we're taught when we're, when we're young that just because everyone does it doesn't mean we should do it. Whereas the positivist does, in some sense, think that that's the way the law is fixed in, in the following way. That when we consider the tests for uh, legal validity, that is the test for whether uh, a rule is legally binding in a jurisdiction, we're supposed to look at what members of the community, and at least in the modern form, what um, what officials, judges, legislators, um, and the like, what they uh, what tests they accept. Um, so, so in some sense, the law is just what we do around here. Whereas a natural lawyer thinks that um, you know there are not there are no two domains here. There's only one domain, the domain of reason, and that the proper way to do, determine what the criteria of legal validity are um, is through moral argument, essentially by showing that they're morally legitimate. And of course, there are many ways of doing that, but that's essentially what you would need to do. So the United States Constitution, what would make that legally authoritative? Um, well, it can't be. Article 7, the ratification clause, because that's part of the Constitution, so it's, it's not legally operative until the Constitution is legally operative. So the explanation from the philosophical point of view um, is that um, uh, from, for, for the positivist, the Constitution is the Constitution because officials in the United States accept it, whereas for the natural lawyer, it's that um, it is a morally legitimate um, plan of government for, for whatever reason. Um, the way that this segues into um, the hard to work debate is that um, HLA Hart was um, uh, kind of the, 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 the great legal positivist of uh, the last century, and his um, theory has been extremely influential. Um, and uh, Ronald Dworkin, at least in this way of distinguishing between legal positivists and natural lawyers, um, uh, Ronald Dworkin has been the most important natural law theorist um, and um, has been... Um, the most um, um, uh, trenchant uh, critic of Hart's uh, positivism. Um, so I'm going to throw this over to Brian to, for him to describe um, um, how the hard working debate um, arose and, um, and how he thinks how it ended. Right. Let me, let me actually make one or two comments about what you said and maybe, maybe ask a question to you about this. So I take it right, one implication then of, of natural law views is that legal systems or purported legal systems, purported laws that throw, fall below some threshold of moral acceptability are not in fact legal systems or not in fact laws, right? So sufficiently right. unjust laws are not laws at all on, right. um, on this kind of view. And I think we probably also want to say, um, in fairness to a lot of other natural law theorists out there, there are a lot of natural law theorists who don't think Dworkin um, uh, is, uh, is actually part of, part of their camp. Um, I take it one of the reasons is that they think he has a somewhat uh, funny and unusual view about the objectivity of morality. Um, but I take it the crux of the matter is, is that he doesn't... Uh, Right, he does think that the positive law of a community, that is the past official acts, the official institutional history of any particular legal system, right, is not irrelevant to the question of right, what norms are in fact legally valid in that, in that community right now. Um, and it, so I take it that's another issue where he may part company with, with some natural law theorists, especially those who self-identify with, you know, with the various Catholic um, traditions. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, or whether this. No, I, what, what you say, what you say, no, no. Uh, what, 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 what you say seems to me absolutely right. Okay, so let's let's go uh, then to this uh, this so-called hart dworkin debate. Um, so Hart published the concept of law uh, in 1961. 1967, Dworkin published uh, a paper called The Model of Rules. 
what we now usually refer to as the model of rules one, since he published then a second paper criticizing Hart's positivism a few years later. Both of these papers um, are in Dworkin's uh, 1977 collection, Taking Rights Seriously. The model rules one um, proposed a series of uh, criticisms of Hart's positivism organized around a certain picture of what Hart's positivist theory of law amounted to. And hence the title of the article, according to Dworkin, Hart's picture of law is that law is a model of rules, and indeed Hart does, of course, say in the concept of law that law is the union of primary and secondary rules. But for Dworkin, the word rule, of course, has a certain kind of... um, technical meaning. Um, That is, a rule is a kind of legal standard that is to be distinguished from another kind of legal standard that Dworkin called principles in the 1967 paper. Rules and principles are to be distinguished basically in terms of the logic of their application. So when the factual predicate of a rule is satisfied according to Dworkin, the rule simply determines uh, the outcomes of the case. It applies, as he says, in an all or nothing fashion. Principles, he says, are different. The factual predicate of a principle can be satisfied, but that doesn't mean the principle controls the outcome of the case. The principle has uh, a dimension that Dworkin refers to as weight. The the judge must weigh particular principles, all of which are arguably relevant in a particular case, and then decide according to some process of reasoning that is not made explicit in the model of rules, but made explicit in Dworkin's later work, has to decide which principle ought ought to control the outcome. So when Dworkin says in this 1967 paper that uh, Hart's positivism is a model of rules, he means it can only account for the way in which legal standards that are rules in this terms of their logic of their application are actually part of a legal system. And then to put Dworkin's criticism very simply, he says, there are also these legal standards called principles which are legally binding on courts, and according to Dworkin, Hart's positivism can't uh, make any sense of this fact can't account for how it could be that principles are legally binding. Now, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, skip certain details of the, uh, of the critique in the model of Rules 1 and focus on what, what seems to me uh, to ultimately be the, the crucial issue, which is that Dworkin thinks um, that there are some principles that are legally binding not uh, in virtue of their pedigree or source, not in virtue of the courts having adopted them over a long period of time, not in virtue of their having been enacted by a legislature, and so on. Some of them are legally binding simply in virtue of their content, or what he refers to as the sense of appropriateness, or that they speak, uh, they satisfy demands of fairness or basic justice, and so on. So some principles are legally binding in virtue of their content. Dworkin says Hart's positivism can't account for how principles could be legally binding in virtue of their content, since on Hart's theory, right, the, at the foundation of a legal system is what Hart calls a rule of recognition, the rule that specifies the criteria of legal validity that apply in a particular community, and the rule of recognition, according to Dworkin, can only include pedigree or source-based criteria of legal validity, ergo, positivism can't make any sense of legal systems in which principles that aren't pedigreed are nonetheless legally binding on the courts. Now, there, uh, there are sort of over this particular problem, it seems to me, emerged sort of the, the split we've identified now by the labels inclusive or exclusive legal positivism, or soft and hard positivism, to use Hart's label. That is, Hart's response to Dworkin's point here is to concede to Dworkin that some principles can be legally binding, but not in virtue of their pedigree, but to dispute Dworkin's claim that a rule of recognition can only employ source-based or pedigree criteria of legal validity. So on Hart's view, the view that he makes quite explicit in the postscript to the concept of law, which appeared in 1994, on Hart's view, there's only one important fact about a rule of recognition, namely that it is a certain kind of social rule, where a social rule, according to Hart, is a rule that exists in virtue of two conditions being satisfied, First, there has to be a convergent practice of behavior among some group of people. That is, they all do the same thing. But secondly, 
they uh, they take a certain attitude towards their practice. That is, they accept the rule describing their practice from what Hart calls an internal point of view. I commend to listeners Scott's very illuminating paper on the internal point of view, which is on, I believe it's on your SSRN page. Is that right? Yes, it is. Thank you. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to gloss the internal point of view, uh, point of view for purposes now fairly, fairly superficially, but those who are interested ought to, ought to consult your paper on that. So the idea is that the rule of recognition of a legal system is just a certain kind of social rule constituted by the practice of officials of the system in deciding questions of legal validity. That is, what criteria do they converge on? And more importantly, right, do they take themselves to have an obligation to apply these particular criteria in deciding which norms are legally valid? And if a rule of recognition is only a social rule, right, then there's no particular constraint on what the criteria of legal uh, validity are in any legal system. It's purely contingent on what the actual practice of officials in that system is. Therefore, according to Hart, right, this point that Dworkin makes, namely that there are some principles that are legally binding but not in virtue of their pedigree, all Dworkin has really noticed, according to Hart, is that there are some legal systems in which the criteria of legal validity um, are content-based criteria. That is, certain norms are legally valid in virtue of their being fair, appropriate, just, and so on. Um, and therefore, from Hart's perspective, Dworkin's theory and Dworkin's criticism is just a version of what Hart would call soft positivism. Soft or inclusive in the sense that it allows that a rule of recognition can include or incorporate moral criteria of legal validity. The flip side of this, right, the, the other response, which... Um, uh, which is most often associated with with Raz, though you, of course, have defended an important version of uh, of this view as well. Um, says that um, actually, right, it's not the case that principles that um, lack a pedigree can, in fact, be legally binding. So what the harder exclusive positivist says is just because judges talk as if such principles are legally binding doesn't make it so. As our good friend Les Green says, Dworkin has the King Midas theory of law. Just as everything that King Midas touches turns to gold, everything the judge touches turns to law, it seems, in Dworkin's view. Um, and the hard positivist says, don't be misled by the rhetoric of this. A rule of recognition can, in fact, only incorporate um, content-neutral criteria of legal validity, that is, criteria that do not require an evaluation of the content of the norms whose legal validity is in question. It can incorporate only source or pedigree-based criteria. Raz, of course, famously argues for this conclusion based on a certain conception of um, what is involved in the law's claim to authority over us. You've argued for a similar conclusion uh, based on the idea um, of what it is to be guided by uh, guided by a rule, we probably won't go uh, go into too much into this uh, in the discussion today. So that I think now that that covers sort of the I, what I what I take to be the key issue that comes out of the model of rules one. But before I go further, let me ask you, Scott, whether there's there's other aspects of the debate in the model of rules one that you think ought to be highlighted for purposes of the the debate that we're, that we're working up to about theoretical disagreement. Um, no, no, I, 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 I think you did a typically fantastic job in, in, in laying it out. I really think that kind of uh, tees up um, the next, kind of the next stage. Do, do we okay, want to... Let me ask you, is, is it worth saying anything in this context about the model of rules two? Um, or... It's in, the model, the, 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 the um, the new critique of Hart um, first emerges in the model of Rules 2, um, but it, it gets its full expression in, in, in Law's Empire, um, and model of Rules 2 is a, is it, it kind of an, um, an in, it, it, um, sets out a kind of an in-between position. Um, so I, I think probably the best thing to do is just to, 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 to describe the new critique that that set out in Law's Empire in, in Dworkin's uh, 1986 book. Okay. Um, and right. So, so now so we fast forward almost 20 years to the, to the 1986 book where the, the problem of theoretical disagreement arises. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you to, to, to articulate why this is supposed to be a problem for the legal positivist. Right. Okay, so so um, notice that um, according, according to both the exclusive and the inclusive legal positivist, um, um, they, they, they share a common assumption, 
which is that whatever the criteria of legality is in a particular legal system, uh, that those criteria are fixed by official consensus, by convergent behavior among officials. The only disagreement between um, the two camps has to do with what the object of convergent behavior can be. For the uh, inclusive legal positivist, the criteria can make reference to um, moral facts, to content-based principles, um, whereas for the exclusive legal positivist, it can only make reference to um, social facts, to pedigreed, uh, to pedigreed um, principles. But they both agree that the criteria of validity are fixed by consensus. Um, the critique in, uh, in Law's Empire uh, tries to show that, in fact, in at least the American legal system, the criteria of legal validity are, are, not, um, are not the object of any consensus, that uh, theoretical disagreements are, uh, are quite widespread. Um, judges and lawyers and academics um, argue about what the right interpretive methodology is, um, and um, this would be very difficult to explain on the Hardian model. Um, let me let me give the let me give an example that uh, that uh, Dworkin gives, um, which I think will highlight the ways in which uh, the uh, criteria of legality in the form of interpretive methodology um, how that can be um, uh, quite controversial. Um, the the one of the cases that Dworkin mentions is uh, the famous Supreme Court case of uh, TVA versus Hill, the Tennessee Valley Authority uh, versus Hill. This was a case in the 1980s um, where conservationists sued uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority um, um, uh, to have them uh, stop uh, um, uh, for for, um, them not to complete um, a $100 million dam um, because the completion of the dam was going to um, destroy the, um, the existence of this, this small fish called the snail darter. Um, the snail darter was a three-inch fish, which um, really was of no commercial, aesthetic, or scientific value, but it, did, um, um, it was endangered, and according to the in, uh, Endangered Species Act, which was, by the way, passed... Um, after the dam was authorized, funded, and almost completed, um, that, uh, that uh, according to the act, that a court was required to issue an injunction to stop the completion of the dam. Now, of course, this would have been an extremely wasteful thing to do, um, but um, the conservationists argued that if you read the, the statute, that's what's required. Um, the Supreme Court, in the majority opinion written by Chief Justice Warren Berger, um, held, uh, sided with the conservationists. Um, Berger said that if you read the plain meaning of the Endangered Species Act, there doesn't seem to be any exception for um, construction projects which were substantially completed by the time of the passage of the Act. And since Congress didn't seem to uh, indicate that they wanted um, these projects to continue, um, the court was required to follow the plain meaning of the Act and uh, issue the injunction. The dissent, on the other hand, written by uh, Lewis Powell, argued that when a when the plain meaning of the statutory text gives you an absurd result, um, uh, judges have the discretion not to follow it. And since Congress didn't specifically intend for um, for the court um, to to uh, to implement this absurd result, um, the um, the dissent believe that courts have the discretion to depart from the plain meaning. Now, Dworkin concludes from this um, this disagreement that this was a disagreement over uh, the proper interpretive methodology and therefore the proper criteria of legal validity for the American legal system. Uh, Berger thought that the right way to interpret statutory tax was to stick with the plain meaning even when it gives you an absurd result unless Congress wanted you uh, uh, to um, uh, to depart from the plain meaning, whereas Powell thought that um, judges had discretion to depart when it gave absurd results uh, unless there was a specific congressional um, intention that, um, that uh, um, the court um, implement the absurd result. Now, if in, 
Now, this, Dworkin called this a theoretical disagreement. It's a theoretical disagreement because it's a disagreement not about whether the agreed-upon test for legality applies in a particular case. That is, they're not disagreeing just over the facts. According to um, Dworkin, what they're disagreeing about is the correct test for interpreting statutes. Um, and this, he said, was, um, was inexplicable on a Hardian framework. It's inexplicable because on the Hardian framework, the criteria of legal validity and interpretive methodology are fixed by consensus. But um, um, if there is widespread disagreement about what the criteria of legal validity are, that shows that there really is no consensus about what the right criteria are, and therefore there's no fact about which participants can actually have a disagreement. So it would seem that the that the prevalence of the prevalence of theoretical disagreements would um, would um, be inexplicable on the Hardian framework. Dworkin concluded from this that the only way to explain the um, the existence of theoretical disagreements was to say that what judges and lawyers and legal academics were engaged in theoretical disagreements, what they really are arguing about, is about what, from the moral point of view the, um, the uh, criteria of legality ought to be, and since he took a natural law position, he thought that that's in fact the way the criteria of legal validity are in fact fixed. That is, they're fixed by what the moral facts would, would indicate um, are the uh, legitimate ways of, of, of proceeding. Um, simply because um, he thought that consensus ran out Yet, nonetheless, there was a right answer about what test of legality um, judges uh, judges were to use. So he took this as being um, um, a, a, a demonstration that the natural law position, as I described it, um, before, was the only viable position because the positivist just couldn't explain a core feature of legal practice. So, uh, let me ask you one, one question about one aspect of, of what you said. What, what, what do you think Dworkin thinks entitles him to assume that there has to be a right answer to the question of what test of, uh, of legal validity should apply in a case where it's precisely that which is, is contested? Well, I, I think... Because I think it's an important kind of assumption that, uh, that oh, obviously, obviously drives a, obviously. an enormous amount of his, enti- his theory. Right. So, so let, let me just distinguish between two questions. One is um, Dworkin is... Um, Famous for um, for proposing uh, the right answers thesis, which is to say that he thinks that there's always a right answer to um, every legal question. Um, there's another question which which you just addressed, which is what why think that when there is uh, disagreement over interpretive methodology, um, why think that there's a right answer to that? Um, and so let me right. let me let me address the the, the second question. Um, I think he just thinks that um, when you engage in legal philosophy, what you're trying to do is trying to give the best explanation of legal practice. And since the participants take themselves um, to, um, to be arguing over a fact of the matter, that would seem to indicate that they're following a certain ground rule which states that consensus isn't necessary for um, for there to be an answer to the question about what is the test for legal validity. So well, it's... Um, can, I, can I interject something here? Which is I, I, I think actually we can give a, a stronger response on behalf of Dwork, and I wouldn't want to get into this habit, but let, let me do it on this, <laughs> this occasion. Um, right. That is, I, I think... Yeah, this is being thinks, recorded. <laughs> I know. I, yeah. I think... Uh, I, I take it Dwork and thinks... It can't just be that the, that the best explanation of the practice, right, is the only consideration. It has to be how we understand what a best explanation is, because there's a best explanation of a lot of practices that doesn't necessarily take what the people say in the practice at face value, okay? So I don't, for example, think that the best explanation of a religious or theological discourse, and I suspect you share this view, is one that takes at face value um, what it is people engage in that practice say, because I'm inclined to think that those particular discourses are systematically false. But whether one thinks that or not, when one thinks of other examples where the best explanation wouldn't necessarily be one that credits what people themselves believe about what they, what they think they're, they're disputing about. 
I take it that what's really key for, for Dworkin here is that he thinks the best explanation of the practice of law right, um, is going to have to be one that um, uh, makes a certain kind of moral sense out of the law. That is, it's going to have to be one that ultimately shows that when the courts are deciding contested issues as they were in TVA versus Hill, that they have a certain kind of moral authority that justifies them to ultimately coerce the parties before the court. And he thinks that assumption requires us to assume that there has to be uh, a right answer at both the levels you distinguished, right? That is, at the level of what he would call an empirical disagreement as well as at the level of, of, of a theoretical disagreement um, uh, in any explanation of the, uh, of the practice of legal dispute and legal discourse uh, in, in these cases. Um, and, of course, that assumption is not one shared by the legal positivists, right? That is, it's not the case that the positivists think that the best theoretical account of law has to be one that shows that courts are justified, morally justified, in exercising their uh, coercive power over the people who come before the court. That is the proverbial separate question, right, that, uh, that a positivist theory is willing to leave open, but Dworkin's theory is, is not. Would, would, would you agree with that way of characterizing it? Actually, I, I, I mean, the, the, not not really. I mean, that when you when a legal philosopher is trying to reconstruct the social practice, what he's trying to do is he's trying to figure out what are, what are the rules which govern this practice. How um, how are what are the legitimate moves to make? And mm -hmm. it seems to me that the only way to discover what the legitimate moves to make within the practice are is by examining um, what the participants think at the kind of the deepest level um, uh, legitimates various moves. So it's an attempt to engage in a rational reconstruction about the, what the rules of the practice are. Mm -hmm. And so at the we, we, we need to know... We need to know what kinds of arguments are acceptable kinds of arguments to make, right. and the and the fact that uh, participants don't think that the controversiality of an interpretive methodology automatically uh, excludes it from being uh, an acceptable uh, answer or there being a fact of the matter seems to be the fundamental ground rule of that practice or, or, or tells you something important about what fundamental ground rules of that practice um, are. Is that... Is that uh -huh. I so see. Like if so you want to know about hopscotch, if you want to know about hopscotch, mm -hmm. you'd want to see the rules that the, 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 kids are, the kids are following when they play hopscotch. It's the same thing in, um, in reconstructing legal practice. You want to see what, what are the participants committed to and then trying to figure out what the best rational reconstruction of what they're doing, whether they committed to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but look, it, it, it can't be the case that every move that, uh, that officials make um, uh, uh, in legal practice are data points that the theory has to answer to, right? Absolutely I mean, surely it's, right. it's got to be the case that certain, certain moves they make are just outside the scope of the theory, or they're anomalous, or they reflect a certain kind of disingenuity on the part of the actors, and, and so on and so forth. So, it's, so the mere fact that they do it can't be enough to require that the, the best theoretical count is, is going to have to answer to that. I, I take it as a general explanatory principle you'd agree with that. No, maybe I'm not, that, maybe not in this case. No, 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 no. Let's just, let me just be clear what I would mean not in this case. It's certainly the case that we, we should never expect that participants in a practice have a perfect grasp of the practice, um, and that uh, they may be confused at some in, in, in some way. That 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 that, from a methodological um, point of view, has to be correct. It's just what 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 I think is important here um, is that um, I think we shouldn't underestimate the theoretical value of this particular data point. Um, okay. Um, because it kind of goes to the heart of um, the way in which the practice proceeds. It goes to the heart of the way in which um, um, the content of the law is determined. And so that's why I that's why I, um, I think Dworkin is right to credit um, uh, this data point as being 
particularly important. But I will, I'll, I'll certainly say um, um, that there's no, uh, there's no way that Dworkin's um, critique is a, is a falsification of positivism. Um, it, could, it couldn't be, because um, uh, we'd have to take everything into account to see whether the positivist has um, a, a good response to this or... Um, or a better explanation of other pertinent data points that the theory is supposed to answer Absol- to. A- a- absolutely. It may, okay. you know, um, like, t- take, take, um, um, take Dworkin. Dworkin has to swallow a bitter pill. He has to say that certain legal systems which are sufficiently unjust are not law. So what does he say? He says, well, he says they're law in the pre-interpretive sense but not in the post-interpretive sense. So he, he I mean, he has to, he has to, um, um, say that our linguistic practices um, are somewhat confused um, when it comes to when it comes to imputing legality to a certain normative system, but that all things considered, this is the best thing. Positivists might have to do the same exact thing. They might have to um, say that here we can't explain theoretical disagreements. It's, it's but but you know we have um, uh, we have no better explanation. Right. So, so here, here's something I take it we do agree upon, uh, agree about uh, concerning theoretical disagreement, which is that if it's to carry the weight that Dworkin wants to make it carry in Law's Empire, uh, it has to be the case that theoretical disagreement is a very important data point in making sense of the phenomenon of law and legal systems. Right. Absolutely so, right. So, so there we're agreed on it. Now, let, let's go to this question of, of whether or not um, positivism can or can't um, explain theoretical disagreement. Um, and, and this goes back to what, what I was alluding to before, which is that um, there are ways to explain phenomena that obviously don't involve taking the phenomena at face value, um, as, uh, as, as I like to put it. Right? So even Dworkin uh, right, acknowledges, and let's take TVA versus uh, Hill again, that um, while it might look like um, a theoretical disagreement in the sense that there's a disagreement about um, what the actual criterion of validity is when it comes to interpreting the Endangered Species Act as applied to the, the facts in TVA, um, with one side being right, very roughly a plain meaning approach to the statute, the other side taking the view if the results are absurd, then the statute can't be, can't be taken to, uh, to require them. Um, sorry, did you say something about that, Scott? No, 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 no. That's okay. Uh, no, I didn't say anything, actually. All right. The, um, uh, uh, so, so if that's what their, right, their dispute is, there is, of course, you know, another possibility here about how to, how do we explain this, right, which is that um, uh, either the parties are being, right, one of the parties to this particular dispute is being somewhat disingenuous. That is, um, what they would really like to do is change the law, right, um, but, of course, it's unseemly for courts to own up to the fact that what they're trying to do is change the law. So instead, they argue as if there is a criterion of legal validity that requires right, um, uh, the legal outcome that they would prefer to see on the, uh, on the merits. Right? But they don't say that openly. Right? So it would just be a pure case of, of disingenuousness um, in, in how, the, how this debate is being carried out. Um, And there is, of course, another possibility related to this, which is that um, if the best theoretical account of law is the the positivist account, and will grant to Dworkin that the positivist account can't make sense of the face value of a theoretical disagreement, then we may just have to say that parties to theoretical disagreements are making a certain kind of fundamental error or mistake. And it's not surprising they make the error or mistake because it turns on a fairly refined and abstract view about the nature, um, the nature of law. Um, but it would only be worrisome, I think, if theoretical disagreement were as important a phenomenon as Dworkin takes it to be, and as I, I think you, um, you also take it, uh, take it to be. So let, let me make one additional observation on uh, on that point. Um, you know the. Uh, I wonder how important or pervasive the phenomenon of theoretical disagreement uh, actually is. Right? It seems to me that the striking fact about functioning legal systems is that there is massive agreement about what the law is. 
if there weren't massive agreement about what the law is, right, if that is, if theoretical disagreements were just pervasive, um, then we wouldn't find uh, uh, the uh, what, what we actually find in legal systems like the American one, which is that um, it's a small minuscule of all the legal questions that arise um, that actually p- seem to pose, right, make explicit these kinds of theoretical disagreements. So I suggest, look, think of the think of the universe of legal problems as a certain kind of pyramid, where at the base of the pyramid. Uh, you have, say, all the questions that are brought into lawyers' offices. I'm, I'm sorry, we, I, I, um, the last five seconds I missed. It, uh, okay. Um, you were, you were, uh, uh, we were talking about the pyramid. The pyramid, right. So I, yeah, sorry, I said think of the universe of, uh, of legal questions as a kind of pyramid, where the base of the pyramid represents all those questions that are brought into lawyers' offices, and the tip of the pyramid represents those cases that reach the highest stage of appellate review that's available in a legal system. So, for example, cases that make it to the, to the U.S. Supreme Court. It's true enough that in cases that make it to the U.S. Supreme Court, we get a lot of what looks like theoretical disagreements in, in Dworkin's sense. But the striking thing is, is they don't seem to be appearing very... Further, the further down in the pyramid we go, the fewer of these theoretical disagreements we actually see breaking out. What we find is a massive amount of consensus about what the law is. If we didn't find the consensus, then there'd be an awful lot more cases that, act, that are actually getting litigated in the system than we, uh, than we actually find. Because what we know is most cases that are brought to lawyers don't in fact result in any legal action being taken. Even when legal action is taken, right, a lawyer writes a letter or something, lawsuits don't get filed. Even when lawsuits get filed, they typically get settled by the conclusion of discovery because everybody then knows what the facts are and knows how the law applies to the facts. And it's just a question, right, of putting a price tag on what um, what settlement would be satisfactory. Even if the cases that go to trial, most of them actually don't go to verdict. Even if the ones that go to verdict, most of them don't, in fact, get appealed. And at each stage, I think the a core part of the explanation is that we know what the law is, there's massive agreement about what the law is, which suggests to me at least that theoretical disagreement um, is a phenomenon at the pinnacle of the pyramid and not a pervasive phenomenon and not an important data point that a theory of law is supposed to answer to. Now, I know you totally disagree with this, so I'll turn it back to you. <laughs> yeah, no, that, um, well, let, let me, let me um, get the, the, let me address the second point uh, yeah. uh, uh, first. Um, so, what, what do I think Dworkin has shown? What I think Dworkin has shown is that Hart was wrong and his followers were wrong to think that consensus, convergent behavior, is the only way in which interpretive methodology is fixed. Um, uh, that's not to say that interpretive methodology can't be fixed by agreement. Um, if there is massive agreement about a lot um, of... Um, the way in which the law is determined. If there's substantial convergence um, around um, um, certain core rules about um, about uh, um, how to interpret the law in certain areas, then 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 um, then I think that that's uh, legally um, legally appropriate. The what I what I took Dworkin's critique to be, uh, at least what I think the significance is, is it, it opens up the possibility. That consensus might not be the only way in which interpretive me- methodology is fixed. So the um, existence of theoretical disagreements, well, from a practical point of view, is not terribly um, uh, significant in the sense that um, you know most cases will uh, there'll be convergence on most cases. I think it's an, it's extremely interesting theoretical um, uh, um, phenomenon, um, which uh, really. Uh, opens up the possibility that there might be other ways in which interpretive methodology might be fixed, other than other than consensus. So that that's what that's what I I I I'd say to that um, about. Can, the, can I just can I yeah, ask you something course. about that? Because I mean, it's, it's an interesting way to put the point. But I, so I take it that what right that what that would mean is that Hart was wrong in thinking that at the foundation of the legal system was a rule of recognition that was constituted exclusively by patterns of convergent behavior among officials. That's the exactly. force of saying that there's more than consensus at work. Is right. that right? That's exact, yeah, that's exactly right. So so a good portion of it may be um, consensual, but 
other portions may not be consensual. And so okay. the issue is um, the issue is how are the other portions that are not consensual how how are they determined? So right. if you're a positivist, you think they have to be determined by other kinds of sociological phenomenon. Um, whereas if you're a natural lawyer, you think no, they're, that the whole thing is determined by by uh, moral phenomenon. Um, and so um, maybe we can get to that um, um, at the very end, how I think it's supposed to proceed. So that, 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 that's right. It's not to say that um, the whole edifice of, of, of Hart's theory needs to be overthrown. It's just that um, he articulated one basis for uh, fixing uh, the criteria of legal validity, but there are others. But the, kind of the ultimate thing is that you think that these things are determined by social facts alone, not by moral facts. And the question is um, to try to figure out what, what other kinds of social facts um, besides consensus um, are operative. Um, let me just get briefly to the, to the disingenuousness, uh, disingenuousness point. Um, here, here's why I think that that's um, why, why I'm suspicious of, of, the, of, of that kind of argument. Um, why, does it, why does anybody think it would work? That is, um, I mean, among legal professionals. If it were basically understood, even in, 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 in not in, even in kind of in an, in, in an intuitive sense, that um, that interpretive methodologies which are not um, which are controversial, they're not legally um, approved. If people thought that, then anytime anybody offered uh, an interpretive methodology that was novel, they would be accused of acting in bad faith. So, but, but in fact, I don't think that ever happens um, except among positivists. Like, nobody in the legal academy, for example, criticizes um, a law professor or a judge who, who proposes a new interpretive methodology um, just because it's new. What they, in fact, they celebrate it. Um, now, well, well, we have to be careful about that, right? Because often when people in the legal academy do this, it's very unclear what the status of the claim is they're making. Right. That's sometimes right. it's it, sometimes it is the claim that this is the the this is the right way to interpret what the law is, where that means the legally right way. And sometimes it's the claim that from some moral perspective or some economic efficiency perspective and so on, it's a preferable way to interpret the law. Yeah. But it's not a claim about what the existing the existing law already is. So that's an ex- that's an ex- that's an excellent point. And oftentimes I have. Um, Somebody has given a talk, or I, I've seen somebody and say, I, "I don't understand what your argument for this methodology is." And, the, and, and they'd say, "Well, I'm not saying that this is the right legal methodology. I'm saying it ought to be." So right. th- you're, you're, cer- you're certainly right about that. That happens a lot. I, I do think, um, though, that there are a lot of examples um, where uh, the argument uh, that is being made is a, is a legal argument. So, for example, my colleague Bruce Ackerman. He, he does think that um, these various constitutional moments um, in American history did amend the Constitution. Um, and he doesn't think that, 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 that we ought to um, um, uh, uh, amend the Constitution in that way. He thinks that the Constitution was amended in, this, in, in these right. ways outside of the Article 5 framework. But remember, um, there are two part- ways to, to, to account for that, right? I mean, one is the, uh, that there's something disingenuous about it. That in you know in, in the still of the night, Bruce knows that he's putting everybody on, right? Which of course is what most people think about this. The uh, the other possibility though is that he genuinely believes that the Constitution has been amended, and he's just made a mistake, right? No. He is simply in error in thinking no. that he has described what is in fact part of the rule of recognition of the American legal system, namely that the Constitution would be amended by these funny kind of you know popular uprisings of the moment. No, no, that's and, right. And, and that doesn't require assuming anything about whether he's disingenuous or not. He may be totally sincere. He just made a mistake at a certain level of high theoretical abstraction. Yeah. Well, here, here's um, so this goes back to the earlier claim about why credit um, what people think. I was just trying to talk about the the um, the, the, um, the disingenuousness explanation. Right. right. So nobody says, "Come on, Bruce. Um, this is a novel." Theory, it's not accepted, um, and so therefore um, you're you're making a pure normative argument. They don't they don't they don't say that. Well, so well, they, they don't put it quite that way. But what people do typically say is this is a completely incredible, non-constitutional, non-legal claim about the processes by which you can amend the Constitution. 
It is an attempt to basically rationalize after the fact the New Deal revolution rather than acknowledge that the New Deal court simply made a huge amount of new law which is now binding on us because of you know the doctrine of precedent. And right, okay, that, that, right, here, here's the point. The point is, is not that when academics or judges or lawyers make arguments involving novel interpretive methodologies, um, the claim is not that they're not acting in bad faith. They often are acting in bad faith. The point okay. is, is that the that, that the reason why people think that they're acting in bad faith isn't in virtue of the fact that they're offering a novel interpretive methodology. It's rather that the methodology that they're offering is in some sense self-serving. Um, so, well, for, for, so, I, I, so I, I have to say I'm skeptical that that's right. I think sometimes, whether they think it's bad faith or not, they just think it's clearly the case that this isn't the law. Right? I mean, this, of course, is how a lot of constitutional law scholars you know, just react to Dworkin's particular arguments about how affirmative action cases should come out or so on. They say, well, he just left the law behind, right? And he switched it to the grounds of, you know, moral theory, which is fine, but it's not what the law is. So, so, I, right, so I think so it that's, depends that's, on the particular cases. No, I, think, I think that that's right, but isn't that presupposing that there's a way of evaluating these interpretive methodologies um, um, as being legally correct or not? Um, presumably, yes, or else they wouldn't be able to. Um, they wouldn't I, be able to criticize them. I, I think it is presupposing that, but right, what it's presupposing is that certain interpretive methodologies, ways of fixing the content of the law, are legally valid, and some of these new and novel ones, whether it's the Ackermanian or the Dworkinian, right, are just not legally valid. It's just they're doing something else, right? They're making but it do, up. Do they? As yeah, far as the law do, goes, I'm right, sorry. Do they? No, right, do they think that they're making it up um, in virtue of the fact that there's no consensus about this methodology, or do they think that they're making it up because either the result that it, the results that it gives um, um, don't actually comport with past practice, or that it's um, it's um, result oriented, or that um, my my own view is that the reason why they think that these um, methodologies are 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 um, are invalid is because they're inconsistent with other kinds of social facts, which are important in uh, that, uh, which are important in determining the right interpretive methodology. Let, let me give an example as to why I think many people reject Dworkin's um, interpretive methodology. So Dworkin has his own interpretive methodology called Laws Integrity, which essentially requires the judge to survey all past political acts and then figure out which moral principles best fit and justify. Those um, those past political acts. So you're, sp you're supposed to take the the entirety of, of the law and then um, um, uh, try to figure out what moral principles would explain that, and then among the um, acceptable principles, um, figure out which are the morally best principles, and that those more those morally best principles then determine what the law is. Now, I think that a lot of people um, think that that is an incredible. Um, uh, uh, procedure um, is because it seems to be um, inconsistent with um, the attitude that the American legal system takes towards unfettered discretion or the competence of officials in general and judges in particular. That is, they point to the fact that the legal system is extremely distrustful of concentrations of power that it involves great diffusions of power through checks and balances, separation of powers in the form of bicameralism, executive veto, uh, federalism, um, a jury trial, um, the civilian head of the military. These are all things that would seem to indicate that there are limits to um, the competence and character of legal participants. You just can't trust officials with too much power, and so therefore the Dworkinian um, Herculean methodology is inconsistent with this distrustful stance that the system takes towards, um, towards legal participants. Um, and on my, on my view, um, that's, that, that's um, a way in which interpretive methodology may be fixed by social facts other than um, consensus, and, and the way it would go is as follows. With, with, when, when lawyers argue for um, various interpretive methodologies, they worry about things like 
um, what goals and values were, was the legal system designed to promote and to realize what, what are the assignment of roles and what does that assignment of roles show about um, the competence and character um, that those who designed it imputed to legal participants and that what lawyers try to do is they try to show how their preferred interpretive methodology best conforms um, to these judgments of competence and character to this distribution of trust and, and distrust and these judgments of competence and character and the goals and values that the system was designed to serve these are all social facts that is it's a social fact that the system was designed to serve certain values and that certain people were trusted and other people were, were, were distrusted um, and that this may be a way of responding um, to Dworkin's challenge to, to show how other social facts like considerations of trust and considerations of um, the distribution of roles and the um, values that the, um, that the system was meant to serve, um, how they can anchor the choice of interpretive methodology. Um, let, let me just mention, since we're, we're, we're getting close to the, the end of our hour here, so, the, so you spell out this, this alternative way of explaining um, uh, theoretical disagreement, but from within a broadly positivist framework because it explains theoretical disagreement by appeal to a different kind of social fact than, than Hart did. This is in your paper, the, the hart Dworkin debate, uh, a guide for the perplexed. Is that right? right? Is short, that short, Yeah, right. Yeah, sure. Okay, and that is on your SSRN page. Right. right. Um, and my re my take on this, which uh, the the paper on explaining theoretical disagreement, which is on my SSRN page, so I, I don't get to this point. That is, is there an alternative positive as explanation of your form? Because I think the phenomenon in question, theoretical disagreement, can be perfectly well explained in the sense of explained away. Right, not taken at face value within a positivist framework, and if the, that if we tally up right, the different data points that we think a successful theory of law ought to answer to, explaining away theoretical disagreement is not much of a strike against the positivist theory. Indeed, it strikes me as the most plausible thing to say about these theoretical disagreements. Um, and the positivist theory still fare, fares better along other dimensions that we expect a satisfactory theory of law to um, to answer to. So, um, so, so, so can, can I just ask you, uh, maybe could we just conclude by, maybe you could just state why you're a positivist. Why, why, do, you, why do you think positivism um, um, uh, is, is really the um, best explanation um, uh, of legal practice as opposed to uh, and, and so the willing to uh, so and, and, and therefore um, uh, making you willing to bite the bullet about uh, theoretical disagreements. Right. Well, look, it seems to me that um, you know if we go back to the concept of law, right? What was the what was the concept of law purportedly trying to do? The concept of law was purportedly trying to capture how it is the ordinary man familiar with the modern municipal legal system what he understands by that particular kind of, of social phenomenon. Um, and I actually think Hart does pretty well by reference to that criterion. I think he does pretty well by reference to accounting for the kinds of distinctions between law and morality that ordinary people and that, frankly, courts and lawyers want to make sense of as well. Um, so by reference to those, you know, sort of criteria, I think positivism is, uh, is the most plausible theoretical account of the phenomenon. Now, as you know, I'm a little skeptical when <laughs> this is at a meta level about the, uh, the particular methodological posture that, that Hart adopt, but we should probably just bracket that for, um, uh, for this purpose. Um, if you're trying to get a satisfactory analysis of the concept of law, or the concept of law is the one that's implicit in the, the practices of ordinary people familiar with modern municipal legal system, it seems to me that positivism does very, very well. That's a simple answer. I see. Okay. Well, that right. So maybe, maybe um, right. With, with this, with this account for um, uh, kind of the difference between you and Dworkin, and whether you want to credit the ordinary person's perspective versus the legal um, professional's perspective. No, because because I think I, I think legal professionals, um, you know, they're also familiar with modern municipal legal system, and it seems to me positivism captures pretty well what what they think as well. Um, 
I, I don't think, for example, that saying that a lot of these high-level theoretical disagreements are disingenuous is in the least bit surprising to legal professionals. Um, uh, if you haven't read Dick Posner's newest book, How Judges Think, I encourage you uh, uh, to I, read I, it. I just, want, I, I just want to reiterate the point, which is that, of course, I'm not, I, I'm, I, don't, I, I don't want to be taken to, 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 to uh, be holding the naive position that we ought to credit um, a good faith legal pr- uh, participants. I'm just, I, I, my, my point only was is that I don't think anybody imputes bad faith to, uh, to, to judges simply in virtue of their engaging in theoretical disagreements. It's only that when they engage in these theoretical disagreements, they often take positions which are self-serving. So, uh, so yeah. I just want to make that clear. Um, well, anyway, I, 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 I um, um, perhaps... So why are you the par- positive is Scott Shapiro? Assuming <laughs> you, you haven't had to forfeit your, your union card. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, um, yeah many, many uh, people wonder whether I am a positivist anymore. Um, I, I guess uh, two things. First of all, I've never been uh, never been ev- able to overcome um, the the reaction that I think the Nazis or or um, Soviet Union they had a legal system, um, even though um, they were um, um, it was morally illegitimate to exercise their power. Um, so that's one reason. That's kind of just a very uh, basic, so, so that's an appeal um, to a kind of ordinary understanding, right? Which that's is that exactly, that's something exactly can be right. a legal system even though it's really bad. That's right, right. The more sophisticated, um, well, at least the more complex, I mean, whether it's sophisticated or not is, 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 is another matter, um, reaction is that um, on the view that I have that the very function of, uh, of a legal system is to resolve questions about what morally we ought to do. They're to solve moral problems and, and uh, they're to help us um, uh, uh, seize on more, uh, moral opportunities. So... Um, if, in fact, their function was to resolve um, and settle moral questions, it would, um, it would be very odd if um, the way in which we figured out what those answers were but were appeal to morality itself. That is the only way in which we could um, kind of benefit from the law settling of moral questions if, is if the way in which we discovered those answers um, didn't appeal to morality itself. So I see um, Dworkin's theory as ultimately um, 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 making the law uh, into a self-defeating institution. Um, so, so, that's, so, that's so you're actually committed to the view that, that, that legal systems have a certain kind of essential function. Yes, I, right. yes, I am. Yeah, and I, and I think it's an essential moral function that right. is there right. to right. But but whether it satisfies. Um, the fact that it has its function doesn't mean that it satisfies it, and that legal systems that fail to satisfy their moral function are still legal systems, just like clocks which are broken are still clocks. They're right. just bad clocks. So the Nazis had a bad legal system. Um, so anyway, that's that's um, that's um, uh, why 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 I'm a positivist. Um, I okay. guess what um, uh, first of all, let me get, we should we should end here. But let me just simply say that first of all, it's been a, just a great pleasure talking to you as mm-hmm. always. Yes. Um, and that number two is uh, maybe we will spawn a meta debate. Um, that is <laughs> whether the hard work and debate ought to continue, which depending on your view of philosophy is either um, absurd or profound. Um, um, so, I don't think you want to hear that one. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much, Brian. It was just, thank it was you, great Scott. Fun. It was very nice to talk with you about this, and I, I look forward to doing so again. Um, okay. So, take care. Bye-bye. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.